Hello there, welcome. Uh, in this video, I would like to explain how the early parsing algorithm works. Um, if you have been following along in my how to build a computer programming language series, uh, you should have seen uh, how a parser can be built using a tool, uh, a parser generator tool such as NearlyJS. And in particular, we did cover how to use NearlyJS in depth. Uh, and to give credit where credit is due, uh, Nearly it was uh, created by Kartik Chandra. Um, and uh, and NearlyJS is a implementation of, of the early parsing algorithm. Uh, now what this video is gonna talk about, as I said, is how the early parsing algorithm actually works. It was created by an American computer scientist named Jay Early. Um, and uh, he, at present, he has left the realm of computer science and he has gone on to become a uh, family psychologist. And it's actually interesting if you Google him up, you would you would get uh, this description of him, which has nothing whatsoever to do with computer science. But nevertheless, he has really made his mark in computer science as the early parser is one of the really beautiful algorithms uh, that that I have seen. And, uh, and I hope to show you that and uh, sort of let the algorithm speak for itself. Now, I should also talk about what is good about the early algorithm and what is perhaps not so good about it because the early algorithm is not the only parsing algorithm known to men uh, and is actually not even the most popular one. There are other parsing algorithms uh, that are actually quite a bit more popular than the early algorithm, uh, namely the recursive descent. The recursive descent algorithm and uh, bottom-up parsers, parsers such as LR uh, or SLR. Uh, these algorithms I uh, I may cover in the future. So what? How does it? How does early algorithm stack up against these two? Okay. So, so these are the other parsing algorithms. Um, so versus the early algorithm. One thing that early has got is uh, that it is able to work with either left recursive or right recursive grammars. So which uh, the other algorithms actually have some trouble with. Um, and when you're using a recursive descent parser or a bottom-up parser, usually what you have to do is to, uh, when you have a left recursive um, grammar, then, and you're using one of the other algorithms, you usually have to rewrite it in such a way that's not left recursive anymore. Well, the early algorithm, you don't have to worry about that. It, it'll work with anything. So I think, from a developer standpoint, that's actually quite a plus because you, you don't really have to worry about the low level details, such as exactly how to formulate your grammar to make your algorithm work. Another thing is that the early algorithm actually works perfectly with ambiguous grammars. Uh, an ambiguous grammar, what does that mean? An ambiguous grammar is, uh, Given one input, there's actually two possible way to parse that input. So if you take the sentence, slow children playing, there's two ways to parse it. You can understand it as slow and then children playing, or you could understand it as slow children are playing. So that's an example of an ambiguous grammar. You don't know where the parentheses are supposed to sit. Um, so the recursive descent uh, parsing algorithm and the bottom-up uh, 
parsing algorithms traditionally have trouble with ambiguous grammars, but early algorithm will work with it anyway. And it, it will actually give you multiple possible valid parse trees. So it, it will give you both versions, essentially. That's what the early algorithm would do. And uh, if that is important to your application, that's also cool. But I, I would say in general, in computers, like programming languages, an ambiguous grammar is bad news anyway. So perhaps that advantage is not really felt as much. The third advantage of the early algorithm is that it, it, it allows for good error reporting. It allows for, and this reason is actually the original reason I was interested in the early algorithm. I was looking for a way to provide better, more useful error messages, more useful syntax error messages to users. And uh, in my research, I came across the early algorithm and I found that it, it, with this algorithm, there's actually a very convenient way to report good, helpful error messages. And I, I think I might um, sort of cover how that works in a, in a separate episode. Um, okay, so those are the pros of the early algorithm. What are the cons of the early algorithm? Um, well, there's one <laughs> that, that I can identify anyway, which is the, it's actually less performant. This algorithm's runtime is actually n cubed. In the worst case, uh, it uh, in the case when the grammar is not ambiguous, then it's quadratic time, which means n squared. Whereas in the best case for uh, recursive descent and bottom up parsers, they can actually get uh, big O of n time. So that's the main disadvantage there. So th that's sort of like a balance you might want to strike. For me, the good error reporting is so appealing. And to me that I'm, I, I, I really prefer the early algorithm for that reason. And I, I also think the fact that it works with either left or right recursive grammar, that's a very powerful feature as well. Uh, yep, so that's how it stacks up against the other parsing algorithms. Okay, so let's get into it. So um, I'm gonna use this example uh, grammar, which is very small. Uh, and I chose a very small and simple grammar because I wanna keep the uh, keep the working out of the algorithm uh, at, at a reasonable size that can fit on this computer screen here. This says uh, the starting symbol of this grammar is term. Um, so that one. And uh, a term can expand to a number, a plus character, and then another term. And that, But a term can also expand to simply a number. Uh, and what is a number? And for simplicity's sake, um, again, due to I have to fit the example in just one computer screen. For simplicity's sake, a number only has a digit. This is a character class in uh, regular expression syntax that says uh, this guy it, it can be any character between zero and nine. Okay, so in other words, if you can imagine what kind of string this grammar can match, it can match something like one plus one, uh, one plus uh, one plus two plus three, and and it can actually keep going. The reason it can keep going is because uh, this guy is a recursive uh, production rule. This rule is recursive in that the right-hand side refers back to itself. So this is the grammar that we're gonna work with. And uh, for this example, let's say we're gonna have the input of uh, one plus one. The first thing early does is generate a table, um, a state table. And uh, because it's a state table, we abbreviate it using the letter S. And the table, has a number of columns and we're gonna denote the column. So you, you can look at it as like a table. So these are the columns and each column has a bunch of rows in it, as you can imagine. And then we're gonna label each column with an index number. 
and so forth. So when the algorithm initializes, we're going to create the first column, which will be column zero. So that that's labeled as zero. And what you do is you start with the starting symbol. And in this grammar, the starting symbol is term. And what we do is for each definition like uh, of the starting symbol, meaning the, the starting symbol is on the left hand side of the arrow, we're going to copy it into this starting column. So that would be term. Inside each rule inside the table, um, there's a, a couple of additional pieces of information. Number one is the cursor, which is written as a dot. Um, and it denotes where, where within this rule the progress of matching has reached. And because here, because we're at the very beginning of the algorithm, we haven't even read in any characters from the input yet. The, we're at the starting position. So the dot is at the very beginning of this rule on the right hand side. So this looks like so. And so we copy the first possible expansion of the starting symbol term. And then we're going to do the same with the second one. And again, we're going to put the dot at the beginning because we haven't read in any symbols from the input. Okay. Um, now, along with uh, each rule, we're gonna also going to label each rule. Uh, we probably shouldn't call these rules necessarily because there's some additional state uh, associated with the rule. So we should probably call each line here a state rather than a rule. But along with each state, we're going to also attach a number corresponding to the column within the table where this this state was initialized. In this case, that would be zero. So I'm going to put zero in parentheses. It's zero for both of these cases. Now we're not done yet uh, because for each case where the, to the symbol to the right of this dot is a non-terminal symbol. Uh, and, and a non-terminal symbol is something that is defined uh, using a rule like term and number, whereas a terminal symbol is a symbol that it's a literal string, like a plus, okay? So number is a non-terminal symbol, and this literal plus, that's a terminal symbol. So for each case, each state within this table where the thing to the, to the right of this dot is a non-terminal symbol, this is potentially matching a number next. So we're basically going to take each rule, each production rule in the grammar where it defines what that symbol is, in this case, number, and copy it into this column as well. So we're going to copy number here. And again, we haven't read in any input yet. So the dot is at the beginning of this rule as well. Here, so we're, and, and at this point, um, to the right of the dot, we have something that is actually a uh, terminal symbol. This is, it's, it's going to match a literal character, uh, some digit, right? So, uh, and at that point, we don't have to expand this anymore. Uh, and then this also means because the thing immediately to the right of this dot is an actual, like a, like a terminal symbol. You're actually trying to match some string or some token here. Um, we're expecting this to come, okay? But at this point, we're done with the zeroth column of the table. And for the next state, we're actually gonna read in a character. Now I'm gonna move on to state number one, which is the second column of this table. And for state number one, we're gonna read in the first character, which is the character one, okay? And whenever we read in a character, let me draw a little line 
Yeah. Whenever we read in a character, what we're going to do is uh, go to the previous column and we're going to look for a rule where this character matches the next expected matcher. Um, and the next expected matcher has to be a terminal symbol for this to work. So this rule is not going to work because that's not a terminal symbol. That's not the terminal symbol. This one is. Uh, and in the case that the thing immediately to the right of the dot is a terminal symbol, we're going to try to match it with a character that's coming in. One. Does one match this character class? A digit between 0 and 9? Yes, it does. Cha -ching. So we can actually advance this the state of this rule by moving this dot over because we, we have progressed in the progression of this rule. So what we're going to do now is copy this rule over. Oh, one more thing before I do that. I do want to label the where this state started from, which is zero. And then I'm going to move this rule over while moving the dot over by one. And but this zero, the fact that this state started at the zeroth column that remains unchanged. Okay, and now uh, we actually actually have completed this rule, which means we have successively matched a number, which is a non-terminal symbol. So we can say, yeah, we we have collected a n number one. The character one successfully uh, parses a number, and because of that, we can actually go back in the previous column and find other other rules where it's expecting a number as the next thing to come which for which there are two states in that in that situation both of these so for that reason we're going to copy both of these rules over while moving the dot over so this dot originally at the starting point we're going to move it over so we're going to write number first the dot and then the plus sign, and then term. And also, the, the fact that this, this rule started at index 0, that does not change here. So we're going to copy that over, although the position of the dot does change. <clears throat> and we're going to do the same with the next rule, because that rule is also expecting a number, which has been completed by this state over here in S1. Uh, so we're going to say that gets carried over to here. And so we are moving the dot over to after number. And then also the fact that this, this rule started at index 0 also doesn't change here. Okay, so very good. And now we can see that, oh, we have completed... Uh, the term as well, which started at the beginning. If, if there's some non-terminal symbol to the right of the dot uh, in any state within this column, then we have more expansion to do. But in this case, we actually don't. And then I'm going to continue with the next state. So we have just parsed the character one. Now we're going to move to the next character. Oh, by the way, I should label the the symbols in the input. Uh, so, so this is index one, this is two, and this is three. Uh, okay, so uh, so the next character to read from the input is this plus character. And again, we're gonna search through the column in, in the previous column of the table, S1, and look for a state which is expecting a plus sign. Uh, immediately to the right of the dot, which we conveniently find that in this rule here. Okay, we get we're, we're expecting a plus sign and we get it, which is great because that means we can take this state 
copy it over and move the dot over and the fact that this rule started at state zero of the table that remains unchanged um, and then now we we have uh, we, we have moved the dot over and now the next expected item in this production is actually another term um, are there any other rule that we can uh, scan using this new character plus to scan no however we can expand this next term that's expected now because the this next term we can use the production rules of term to expand to figure out what is the next character or the next terminal rule that we're expecting so we're gonna go down the this production rule set and just copy them over so the first one is term expands to number plus and then the term and we're gonna actually put the dot at the beginning because we're at the beginning of this term and this time we, we're gonna show that this state uh, even though this rule is the same rule as this one but this state is different from this one because we're, we're matching the term um, starting here we're, we're trying to we're expecting a next term after this plus sign we're starting at a different index of the input and that index is whatever the index we're dealing with right now which is two so this 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 from index what the, this the index from which we have started trying to match the rule that differentiates uh this state and this state okay and so but that's not the only rule that we, we need to instantiate because term can also expand to just a single number so we also do copy that down as well and this one also started at index two but we're still not done because we can expand number as well a number is also a non-terminal symbol and we're expecting that next we expand all the non-terminal symbols until we're left with just the terminal symbols so we're going to look at the rule that can expand a number for which there's only one of them so we're going to copy that down and again that this cursor is going to be at the beginning of this one and again this rule we started matching it at index 2 okay uh, all right so now we are ready to accept the next character from the input the last character of the input is one and um and we're gonna search through the states in the last column of the table for a state that's expecting a number a, a, yeah a, a, the digit as the next thing uh so not that one not that one not that one that one right this one is expecting a digit as the next thing to come and because it matches what the input is the progress of this rule advances we can move this dot over like so but we don't draw it like that we copy it over to this new column in the table like so so the dot is at the end of this rule now and the fact that this rule started at index 2 that doesn't change and we're gonna copy that over and th that's really the only rule where we were expecting a terminal symbol so we're done with that part but the next thing is to realize that oh we have completed this number symbol so because we completed this number symbol we can actually uh, go back through the other states which were expecting a number symbol next uh, where do we go back to to complete those rules we base it on this index number like where did this rule start well at index two so we're going to go back to the column two to find rules that were expecting a number symbol next and now we can resolve those because at this point we have completed a number symbol so looking 
uh, in S2, we see actually two rules that we're expecting a number as the next thing to come. And we can actually move this dot over for both of them. And the, this from index remains unchanged. We just copy it over. We're also going to do it for this one. Okay. So we have also, you can see that uh, while, while this rule, we, we have this cursor in the middle of in the middle of this progression. Uh, but this rule, we have actually completed a term. So we can actually, again, uh, r resolve the completion of a term. And how do we resolve it? Again, we look back to the from index of this state, uh, which is two. So we go back to S2 and find any rule that is expecting a term as the next thing to come immediately to the right of uh, the cursor. And we actually have a rule that matches that, is this one here. Uh, immediately to the right of the dot, we have a term, which is what we just completed. So we can actually do the same thing again. Oh wait, I didn't draw the arrow. And so, so we, by completing this guy here, we completed a term, which is also going to resolve this next term that was that this rule was expecting. This rule, this term rule, actually started earlier. It started at index zero all the way from the beginning. So that's actually uh, we're we're completing more work now. So this rule will get copied over, and we're going to move the dot over. And again, we're going to copy the from index over. And at this point, we have this dot at the end of this rule, which means that we've completed this term. Yay. Um, and because we're out of characters from the input, we have done, we have done reading in all of the input. Uh, at that point, what you do is go through all of the states in the last column of the table and find all of the states where the dot is at the end of the rule and the from index is zero. And you, as you can see, the only uh, state where that is the case is this one. And therefore, this is actually a complete parse of, of all of the input. Um, and that, that's how the early algorithm works, at least for this very simplistic example. Now this algorithm, you might realize that it's kind of tedious uh, to do uh, by hand, but luckily it's an algorithm. That's why we can make a computer do this for us. And again, that does exactly what nearly JS will do for us, right? So, um, so what we can do is tell nearly JS to compile this grammar. Um, so we can do it using nearly C, uh, taking in the nearly file, and we'll tell it to um, output a JS file of the same name. And after that, I'll spit out this JS file, which is a JavaScript representation of the same grammar. And then with this JS file, you can actually um, use the parser to parse an input. Um, and a easy way to do this without having to write up a JavaScript file is use the nearly test utility. Uh, what you do is you give the JavaScript grammar, JavaScript version of the grammar to nearly test. And then you define the input using the dash i argument. And then you can put in uh, any input you desire, I'll put in one plus one. And here, uh, nearly will perform the parsing algorithm and actually show you uh, each column of the table. Uh, it, it actually calls each column of the table a chart. Uh, actually, a chart is what I believe what Jay Early calls it. it it's a chart-based parsing algorithm. Uh, and uh, if I have done it correctly, then this should, the, the state of this chart should match up with what I did by hand here. And if you're interested in experimenting with grammars of your own, uh, 
you can write grammars of your own and test it like this and and see what chart output you get uh, to sort of test uh, your intuition about how you understand how well you understand the early algorithm so that that is my introduction of the early algorithm i hope you enjoyed it if you do want to get into more detail about the algorithm uh, there's actually quite a bit of information on the wikipedia page uh, it, it even has a pseudocode of the algorithm itself as well as links to the original papers that were published by Jay Early detailing how the algorithm works and if you click on one of these links it, uh, it links to his original paper which you can download and print out and peruse uh, at your own leisure. Actually I probably will have more to say about this algorithm in the future so if you're interested in that then stay tuned.